just about a month ago as things were starting to sprout. Um, on the right side is just is two rows of spinach, two rows of lettuce, two rows of carrots, and then uh, arugula, beets, and radishes. Um, this is today, um, a month later. The the middle bed is the one I just showed you that had, uh, it's basically, we just started to harvest, uh, well, we started harvesting radishes a couple weeks ago, but um, what I do is I just take a scissors and I, I mow down the, the young greens and kind of just work my way down the bed. And as the, uh, as you get to the one end of the garden, you can almost go back to the other end right away and start harvesting again. So you can probably get, you know, three, four harvests out of the, uh, Aurora greens before they're, you know, kind of too bolted and too big. And this is like, this is the best time of year for a lot of these greens before they get bitter. All the stuff in the right bed there um, is kind of squeezing it a little bit. I mean, we got about 30 some kale plants in that bed, a dozen broccoli. Um, those were all started inside about a month ago as well. And we just transplanted them out um, about a week or two ago. Um, then the, the, on the end there, onions and, and garlic, we put in a uh, direct seed, um, again, about a month. So things are, are happening. Um, we started all, uh, so that the hoop, hoop house was all direct seeded outside. Um, the starts inside, we just have a set of four foot fluorescence that, and this was about two weeks ago. Um, that's 50 tomatoes, 50 kale plants, uh, 30 broccoli, maybe 15 peppers and 50 basil plants. And most of those will go in that garden. It's, we're starting to get run out of space here pretty quick. Um, this is today with getting all the tomatoes out of there because they're starting to really want to go outside. Um, so this is a, again, a, uh, almost 50 basils. And um, these are probably won't go in the garden for at least another three weeks. Uh, very sad tomatoes that are <laughs> being transferred inside and outside every day. Uh, it's just too cold for them to really be happy yet. But uh, hopefully that third raised bed we have outside will go uh, uh, pretty much all tomatoes. I, I don't know if I'll get 50 in that 12 foot bed, but that's that's pushing it even for me, but we're, we'll get close. Uh, this was a, a side note, uh, this is called a broad fork. Uh, I made this at sector, the old sector about three years ago. And, and I love it for turning soil. I mean, it's, if, you ever, if you ever wanna turn a bunch of soil by hand, this is a great alternative to a pitchfork. Uh, I actually just, if you notice in this picture, there's five tongs. Um, they're basically cement stakes that I welded onto this box tube and some old postal dig, uh, shovel handles. Uh, this is what it looks like today after we experimented with a different uh, use of this. And if you can see in the in the that photo, there's a there's only three stakes left, and I'll show you why in a second. But the there's a fulcrum on the end of it, and that's really what you you lean into the ground with. So one of our other sort of new home improvement, you know, slash family family bonding times is um, we're tearing up our sidewalk, and so. You, <laughs> It worked great. I mean, it, we got about 10 feet of sidewalk torn up and we only lost two of the tines. I'm gonna have to bring it down a sector when you're open again and weld those back on. But um, but it worked really good for lifting the concrete. We went we went over it first with a jackhammer, but just to pop it in some places, it was uh, pretty indispensable. And that's a new garden, one month in. So you caught any neighbors stealing uh, greens yet? No, I, I've electrified the fence. So <laughs> just waiting for the first sucker, you know. <laughs> no, and, and, I, and, and I built it so that we could add chicken wire when needed for the rabbits, but uh, haven't had an issue yet. Um, so I'm probably pushing my luck a little bit, but. My wife started her tomato plants inside too early and they got too tall for the lights. Yeah. So he had to plant them out already. Uh, they doing a, are you covering them at night or? I don't know. She's going to have to do something because it's supposed to get to 29 on Friday. Yeah. The soil's a little cold yet for him. Yeah. 
So did, did you say you just put regular fluorescent lights above them or do you have like the grow lights in there? I have, they're, they're called T5s. I mean, they're probably similar, similar to what you have in the shop, but they're, they're a little bit higher output than a regular fluorescent, but I've definitely just used regular shop lights before. The trick is just keeping it, keeping the lights, making a table that's really adjustable um, so that you can keep them really close. You know, if they get too close, they get too hot and burn the tops. But um, yeah, regular shop lights work. Um, it doesn't take much really. Um, and then the, you... the trick is really about getting like those tomatoes I had, uh, they just outgrew the pots, um, you know, from like these, I just transplanted last weekend and you can see how spindly they're getting. Um, I should have transplanted by two weeks ago, um, but this was this was two weeks ago, and you know that's just from you know b basically being under um, you know and I leave in the first maybe two weeks I leave the lights on pretty much twenty four seven. Plants really don't have to sleep you know until they get a little older, so you can get a little more boost out of your your starts if you kind of let the light go for. Sean has the uh, most ludicrous garden that I've seen in a long time. So I wanted to sucker him into uh, sharing his setup. Yeah, we just started harvesting. So that's, it's, it's always fun to get it, you know, have the you, season start. You've been added to the list of places to raid, you know, when the true apocalypse comes. I mean, we, we know it's coming this year. Who, so. who, who steals lettuce? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if we we're raising cattle in the back or pork, I mean, I know that's going to be high, high value in a couple of weeks here. But so, do you have plastic over top of the hoops that you had for some amount of time? Yeah. So, like, we, I just, I probably stopped putting the plastic on, uh, on these hoops maybe a week ago. I, what I, and I've done similar techniques in cold frames for for years. But what I, what I found over the years is that the plastic is really, it's buffering the cold rain. And this cold, the, it's basically, it's, what it's doing is it's increasing the soil temperature. It's not so much creating a microclimate. I mean, that helps. I mean, it definitely like, it warms up in there, but it'll still freeze at night. I mean, so the, you're, grow, you're starting things that can handle that frost. Uh, but what you're doing is controlling the moisture. And so that like on, on those really cold, like three weeks ago, we had like three, four days of rain. I just left the plastic on and then I would, you know, at the end of that, I would then water it, you know, just to kind of temper it. Um, but really, like anything that's going in the ground this year, th this time of year, it's all about increasing the soil temperature because just things will grow. Um, I mean, it's like an, another interesting example of things like spinach and like garlic. Those are two things that you plant in the fall, ideally. Although both my spinach and garlic I planted a month ago because um, I didn't have these beds last fall. And they have something in them that allows them to, to, to grow when it's really cold, like, I mean, almost frozen temperatures, uh, but not germinate. And so something about the both spinach and garlic, if you get them just germinated in the fall and then they can go dormant. Um, and then all it takes is, is just sort of that a little bit of a, a boost to get going. So but, but my spinach and garlic are way behind where they could be if I had planted them in the fall. But yeah, no, it's really just about, it's controlling the, that moisture, which keeps the soil at a slightly higher temperature. Um, Really cool. um, and honestly, in, in the past, I've had more issues with overheating than with uh, trying to keep things, you know, warm. But. Any other questions for Mr. Sean? Everybody embracing their pandemic gardening green thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you want to uh, share you guys' display? Sure. So Anders and I, well Anders wanted a minifigure display case for his, his Legos. Yeah, I am. I'm sharing just this part. So I can see. Yeah. Can we, see? we can, it's right here. Um, you guys can see the picture? Yep. Okay. So um, I looked online for some stuff and they were all janky and expensive and so decided to make one and I had some leftover oak boards from when they um, renovated our upstairs, just some red oak plain sawn stuff 
Um, but as you can see, it's nice and quarter sawn on this edge, at least for that piece. Um, and I had some leftover uh, veneer quarter inch oak plywood. And so I, I cut the boards on the miter saw sector and then I made the, the rabbits on the table saw to take the, uh, the plywood back. And I've got one of those strap um, picture frame clamps that I got from Woodcraft. They're cheap, but they actually work really well. Um, it's just a strap with four plastic corners and then you just tighten it up and it worked great. Uh, it's the first time I actually made a picture frame. So this is basically just a picture frame, but then to make the dividers, I bought some eighth inch birch plywood at Woodcraft, just a two by four uh, piece. And Chris had suggested that I cut them uh, on the table saw and then notch them on the table saw and they would interlock. And I got to the cutting them down on the table saw part, but I didn't get to the notching part before the COVID. And because I wasn't really working fast and furious on this. So I asked, well, Chris had sent an email out saying, if anybody needs a tool, they can come by and borrow it. And I said, well, can I just come in real quick and use the table saw? Because I just need to notch these boards. Um, and Chris had showed me how to do it by putting a nail on the miter uh, board for the table saw. And then you just kind of slide the, the, uh, the board over so you get these evenly spaced notches. And so I, I figured I could do it. Um, but Chris said, no, it'll be easier if I just do it for you. So I had the boards all cut um, to the right width. Um, and I had them on my desk at Sector. So Chris just cut them for me. And uh, well, my first instructions were really bad. So then I drew them a picture with uh, actual, the actual dimensions. Um, and he cut them for me. And so then I picked them up. We did the whole drug deal thing where I texted him and then he dropped them off outside sector and uh, then we stained them and urethaned them and I was really worried about how to get the grid, the dividers into the frame and, and, and attach it. At first I was going to glue it but I wanted to finish the pieces before I put the grid in because it's hard to finish otherwise and so I didn't want to glue it. And then I thought I'd just put some brads in from the back, but you know, these are eighth inch pieces of plywood and I was probably going to miss. Well, it turns out Chris had left the, the shelves just a little long and at home I've got a miter saw, so I cut them just right. And so it's all just press fit in there, but the friction is good enough that it's never coming out unless you were like really yanked on it. So. Um, you can, might be able to see a little wave in the shelves, but that's okay. And so then Anders decorated it and uh, we hang it on the wall in his room and that's it. It's not very exciting, but uh, it was a fun little project. And here we have up here, we have Bill Bull riding a ward, which is really not what you're supposed to, you know, that's, that's, that's not in the book, turns out, but. Uh, I told him not to do that. Yeah, so there it is. It was my first picture frame I ever made. Now I want to make lots of picture frames. Looks nice. And with your photography interest on the side, I, I see a synergy in your future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm really, I, I don't know the first thing about framing prints, but uh, I can at least make the wooden frame part now. So that's a start, I suppose. The dragon is temporary. Yeah, we got this hanging on the wall. There's no room for the for Smog. He's too big. We actually need to make another one because he's got way too many minifigures. Um, so maybe we'll make another one after the COVID. Or I just have Chris make me the whole thing. I was waiting. I was waiting for that comment. I'll just send Chris all the instructions. There's yeah, the punchline. You get you get one board a week, buddy. We'll see how long it lasts. <laughs> Well, Chris, Chris is, uh, he's also helping me fix uh, things so I can print things out properly. So uh, I'm keeping him busy. 
Just don't That's tell it. Sarah. Don't tell Sarah I can plasma cut things. That's clearly off the off the record. <laughs> speaking speaking of which, we uh, we did get our uh, Mario bullet here. I think it's, uh, looking pretty good. Cool. Well, thank you, Eric. Sorry to harass you. I figured uh, since I helped you make it, I knew it was done. So. No, yeah, that's here. good. No, that's that's good. So yeah, this is our uh, our bullet out of the fresh out of the oven. So it's a matte matte color, but it still turns out fairly shiny. So, but and then just our our stick. So this part's still warm. This part on the top is not warm. It's way thinner. And uh, it's ready to go out in the garden for one of you to come and steal it, I'm sure. So, Are you going to so, shadow cast them and uh, have them move as well at night? Uh, that sounds like something for that Mark guy who's, you know, around here to, to do. He could run them all over the place. I mean, we got Mario heads and mushrooms. I don't have any green. Uh, I really need some green powder coat to do the, the mushrooms properly. But I was actually thinking about doing white powder coat on the bottom of this and then letting the top rust. I figured that would be uh, most appropriate for color scheme, but uh, I got other things to do. So not so much on the artsy side, more on the demo side. Uh, all right. The other thing I was going to show was our uh, die cutting setup for cutting all the masks. We've been cutting uh, uh, fabric templates, not making the masks, but we're making the fabric parts for the masks. Um, so there's these two common sort of sewing patterns. One was authorized by GHC. It's super duper simple. It's just these like tomahawk shaped parts. And uh, they are really, really, really hard to hand cut. So why they went with this is difficult to understand if they wanted somebody to make a lot of masks for them. But at the end of the day, they uh, you need six pieces total. So it doubles this whole thing. And then they're sewn together to make kind of like a wraparound face mask uh, in, a, in a complicated way. So um, we've cut probably about a thousand of those and then about 2000 or so of the square masks. The squares are a lot more straightforward, but still a lot of work to cut out by hand. So these are dies, uh, they're called rule dies. The rule is like a ruler, so that's the, the metal part here. And then the bottom piece is just a piece of plywood and I'm actually not sure how they cut these. It's definitely not laser cut and every single one has a hole at the start of the hole. So like a drilled hole here. So I'm not sure if it's a little tiny, like a pin saw, kind of like a wire EDM machine that they're running or a, a bandsaw or a jigsaw kind of shape, but it's a really small cut. Like this is a really tiny slit that's in the wood and the wood is thick. Um, and it's not like water jet or anything. This is like mechanically processed. So most places have a really big CO2 laser that do dye, uh, rule dyes. Uh, but this is out in Cross Plains, a company called Plastic Ingenuity donated these. Um, they've donated some stuff over the years to the shop. Um, and so I had called them up and asked if they would be willing to, to give us some rule dye or just the rule material itself, which is just a super sharp razor blades basically. And then I told them we'd make the patterns. And he said, why don't you just send me the pattern? I'll make them. I make these things all day long rather than you guys figure out how to do it. So. The only thing that got us on these are, this edge is really thin, and this blade on this edge is really long. And the only things holding this plywood together are these little tiny notches. Those are continuous uh, wood, which is, so they're notching a chunk out of the metal and then planting the metal partway through the wood. And what ended up happening was it split this part of the die uh, off of here. So we had to put screws in the edge to hold it together. And it's been holding since, so we imagine it'll be fine. But it's a, uh, uh, we were, also kind of figuring out how much material we could cut at once. If you go over the thickness of this, the uh, press just crushes the mold because the press does not care about plywood. Plywood is like jelly as far as the press is concerned. And so despite there being about eight inches of plywood all stacked up, it'll just crush right through the plywood. So we have to set the die um, sort of compression pretty closely to get it not to just smash the crap out of everything. So uh, long story short, I will, uh, I, ironically, I have no fabric here at all. Um, because every little bit of it that we get, we chop up and hand back in about a day. Um, so this is actually some material that UW Housing has gotten. It's some, some spun fiber polypropylene that uh, is not normally used to make masks, but can be used to make masks. They had a UW engineer evaluate uh, that you need three layers of this stuff to perform as good or better than an N95. So there's a guy at Housing who's been sending these out to all the, um, the textile students who've been sewing them up 
And then they've also been cutting these out and, and distributing to some of the UW staff to sew up uh, to make masks. So they, uh, of course, have a another pattern, a third pattern. Otherwise, I could just use this to cut it out for them. But they have, uh, they want seven and three eighths squares. So on a, the material's on a giant roll. So we are currently working with them to figure out how best to process that. But long story short, um, there's a piece of nylon on the bottom here. So this is just a, a board that the um, rule die can cut into without damaging it. Then we've got a rule die on the top and our material in between. We can cut about three quarters of an inch in one cut. And so we can go through and, and chop a lot of it out. Uh, I've got some pictures here from when Jim and I were working on it. Uh, one second. Go back here. Back again. Um, so essentially we're throwing in a huge pile and these are all, this is all scrap fabric that we're getting in. So these are all odds and ends and weird shaped pieces. And then um, basically stacking them up and then pulling out the pieces. You poke your fingers through the bottom where the pieces of plywood are cut out. That's to provide access so you can push the fabric up and out. Uh, it cuts remarkably clean and really fast uh, through as many layers as you want. So um, this thing should play. And of course, our uh, iron worker is not designed to cut fabric, but it cuts just fine. So they normally have a um, little bit different dye or different presses to, to do this, but iron worker is a lot faster. So it's uh, worked out pretty handy to be able to use. So I can show you this one getting cut real quick, I think. There we go. So uh, about the only thing we've done to the iron worker is we put a uh, foot pedal on it. And then the foot pedal allows us to use the limit switches. Ironically, you can't use the limit switches without the foot pedal. I don't know why that design decision was made, but so we turn this guy on. If I hit the foot pedal and keep my hands away, um, it just comes down and then it's done. And then we can pull this out. And, uh, See what we got. Occasionally we have to press it a few times to get the edges to cut, but this is a super thin stack, so I'd imagine, yeah, just cut right through. So when we go to take these out, we have to be super careful because these are just gigantic razor blades. Um, but you can see that we're able to cut, this is like about a quarter inch stack, essentially instantly into whatever the shapes are that we want. So it's, uh, it doesn't take very long. I can do about 600 or so mask patterns in uh, about 30 minutes. And so we're able to go through and um, cut these out pretty effectively and pretty quickly, which is good. So yeah, that's all I got. Anybody got questions on smashing things in the iron worker? How did they make the, uh the pattern for you know to bend that metal i mean do you think they cut the plywood i mean for the olsen mask you know the more complicated one i mean it seems like a kind of a tricky to bend that piece of hardened steel yeah they have uh you'll never guess the name it's called a rule die bender <laughs> and its sole purpose in the world is to bend uh rule dies for die cutting because die cutting is such a common thing if you don't see it normally uh, but the places that do it process foam gaskets, cork, um, all sorts of stuff, fabrics, insulation, all that stuff is die cut. So we have a baby rule die bender here uh, that you've never, never noticed because it's the wire bender. Um, so this thing, you'd have to imagine it's the same way as a rule. Our rules are coming in here through these straighten, straightener rollers. It's got a pinch wheel here that's grabbing and shoving it forward. This bender is able to pivot, so you can do 3D bends with it, but a rule die bender is only 2D. And then essentially, um, there's a pin on the front here, and this pin can go up and down, and then once it goes up or down, it can, it can hit the, in this case, the wire, and push the wire sideways to bend it into a shape. And uh, the rule die bends exactly the same way, so they're able to uh, take a whole series of little tiny, um, uh, bends to get those complicated arcs and lines and whatnot. The only magic they are doing is they have a uh, notcher that's notching out the chunks that are um, where the wood remains. And then they also have a notcher that cuts out 
the uh, correct pattern to nest against another knife. So it actually cuts a tiny diagonal at the top of it so that those two knives come together perfectly on vertical edge. So it leaves like a triangular extension off of one knife that matches up with a triangular bevel of the adjacent knife so that they cut completely together. So there's no like little burr left over. Um, we probably should weld those together. I see a lot of rule dies online where they're welded. Um, and the plastic engineering guys don't weld theirs. And I believe it's because they're cutting really thin uh, vacuum form plastic. So they aren't worried about the side load. Um, in our case, I think it would have helped the plywood a lot to have a, a weld reinforced around the edge of it. But it's our only die, and I don't feel like bugging them to get another one. So I'm not gonna not gonna weld it, assuming that it'll do something bad. So, so on those those real die cutter makers, are they actually can you in, import a DXF to them, and they can spit out whatever form you want, or are they yeah yeah. So I handed them a DXF that was scaled, and then they uh, I believe that all they did is add in those tabs for the plywood mm -hmm. joints. And then um, they may have done something special for the intersections to tell the machine to cut those edges, but that's really it. So they just, they brought in the DXF and processed it. Um, yeah. And then that same DXF is used to cut the plywood template as well. Uh, hmm. And you can make those by hand. What you do then is you run a router and you uh, have thicker plywood and then you partially embed the blade. And that way you don't need to worry about the little notches to hang onto the blade for you. And then you just glue it in. Um, the catch is this process avoids gluing, so they don't have any waiting at all for anything to set up. They can make the die and it's ready to go. They don't have to worry about waiting for the glue to set or anything along those lines. But um, yeah, because these used to be hand bent, they could still be hand bent. Interestingly, you use a CNC router to cut the plywood out. And so if it's cutting the plywood out and you're just pushing the die or the, um, the rule die into the gap that the uh, router left, you, you could force it in to get the approximately the right shape without a ton of effort. So. Hmm. Not too bad. You got some uh, some dies you need chopped out. <laughs> Always projects, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could. Uh, I was joking. You know, you could throw a steak in there, and you could have chopped out steaks instantly. You know, you want you want your rapid <laughs> process. I hear the meat industry is collapsing. I mean, you want some custom die cut chicken wings or something? You could uh, make that happen. <laughs> How about some not very functional, but pretty badass looking uh, leather apocalypse masks? Oh, yeah, we could totally cut leather. You bring the leather, I will cut it. I heard the Harbor Freight aprons are the cheapest way to get leather, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are, th are there still people making a lot of those masks, like the hospitals still wanting them and people are still making them? So the hospitals don't, the hospitals have never used them for themselves, but they have used them for all their service providers to try and minimize the potential for a cross infection by having the service providers reasonably protected. Those masks work well for helping the person who's wearing them prevent them from getting other people around them sick. But if everyone has them on, then it helps everybody out. And so, yeah, there's still a need in our community as well as uh, more broadly, just that people are after the, the masks that way, despite the fact that, yeah, they're cloth, they maybe have furnace filter in them, maybe they don't. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think they're, uh, they distributed as of like two weeks ago, they had given me an update. They said they, they've sewn up and distributed about 5,000 of them. Um, that's individual people sewing these patterns that we're cutting. Um, and then uh, they just emailed me that they've got another bin of material to drop off, which means it's probably another about 1,500 or so masks to cut out. So and that takes, takes maybe two, three hours to cut out uh, like about 15 pounds of cut material so that you can go through it pretty quick. It's about a pound per cut um, if the material stacked and folded well, which doesn't take too long to do. The biggest actually impediment is just folding. If they don't have it folded right and you've got a lot of like um, uh, kind of ruffled material, it'll cut it straight through, which means those ruffles turn into extra length. So then when you undo the ruffle, now your pattern's not right. But for the square ones, I can't imagine it's that big a deal just to tuck it in and sew through it anyways. But uh, for the Olsen mask, where those intersections are more critical, I could see it being a bigger pain. Any other questions? Everybody got a mask, hopefully, maybe. I give you some fabric. You got to sell your own, though. Mr. Nick, you got to unmute. Yep, we have about five masks for each of us now. That's good. You've been sewing them up. Uh, yeah, Jane's been making them. She's cool. got an old Singer Featherlight sewing machine from 1935. <laughs> Works great. Is it, is it Featherlight? 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not, not in the, not in the, maybe in, um, maybe in the context of the times. <laughs> it's it was like, um, it's lighter than a desk mounted model. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds heavy. That's good. Cool. Yeah, it did make a great boat anchor. <laughs> did you want to talk about your bike at all, or? Oh, or uh, 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 yeah, I can. Um, this is um, this bike is called the Zox Twenty Six. It's a front wheel drive. Um, I bought it about twenty years ago. I sold it about ten years ago, and then bought it back. Uh, and um, uh, three years ago, I had a powder coat painted in Monroe, and uh, uh, along with two other bikes at the same time. But uh, it's taken me this long to get around to putting it back together. Um, I do have to. Uh, uh, I didn't mask it totally. The mounts for the brakes, I have to uh, wire brush those with a Dremel to get the paint off of there, so the the brakes will pivot right. But I did uh, have the presence of mind to put bolts in the holes so that I can still still use the pivots. Um, the um, yeah, the way this works is that um, the crank goes up here, the chain goes over a couple of pulleys. Uh, the big one goes here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the tension side of the chain goes down to the cassette there, and then comes back up, and then makes a, a right angle around this corner. So when you turn, the chain twists, but it doesn't derail because it's under tension. Um, I have, um, this is one of three bikes I have that have a front wheel drive set up like this. Um, I have another one. There's another style of front wheel drive bike called the, I don't know what anybody else calls it, but I call it a swinging boom, where this whole assembly swings and you swing your legs with the pedals. I'm actually selling that. That was the first one I built. Uh, I've got two home built bikes for sale. Um, if anybody's interested in a, a project, <laughs> like if you've run out of projects, uh, let me know. And uh, work on the bike transmission is stopped because uh, Jim doesn't return any of my calls and, uh, <laughs> and I can't do anything here. This is kind of like sector 0.67 here. This is a, a, a shadow of what I can do with the shop there, both in uh, equipment and in uh, and people skills. I have, um, I don't, I've actually lost count of how many bikes I have because they're kind of spread around, but I have four hanging up over there, this one, I have three on the other side of the room, my Bellmobile is sitting out in the driveway, and then a neighbor lets us park bikes down in her garage. That's where I usually put the big ones, uh, the Tandem and the Tour Easy uh, are down there, and then uh, while I was cleaning out the bike basement, I put my folding bike down there too. So, uh, you know, whenever people come to visit, I've got extra bikes to share what uh what do you need to do next on your transmission um well i got uh that's over here uh, let's see i don't know if you can see it uh we're putting the transmission on the mountain bike and jim had uh, uh sought out this piece of plywood to get the mounting position right on it uh, so we need to finish moving that around to where the chains are tight because we don't have a good way to tension the chains yet. And then uh, then I just need to hook the cables up and put the spring back in to fill out. We'll be ready to go. I did, um, I am in the governor's business plan competitions still, as far as I know. Um, I just, uh, <laughs> last week I sent in my 20 page business plan for judging. And if I make it past this round, I'll be in the finals. So uh, that's the other thing I'm working on with that. Awesome. Yeah, and I still have the bike that um, Jim got working for me last summer with the transmission on it. That's hanging up over here, so I have something to demonstrate. Uh, the 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 governor's business plan competition has changed since January when it started too. Now that's all. Um, when they do the finals judging, it's going to be everybody makes a video, and uh, I'm a little nervous about that. Because uh, I don't have a, I don't have any kind of a setup to do that, I, and I don't, I want to do something better than a, a, a smartphone video. But um, the MadWorks program that I was in last summer, uh, Colin from there just emailed everybody and said that they had extra money left in the budget at the end of the year, so they're sending, <laughs> they're splitting it and uh, sending uh, a little bit of a bonus check to everybody who was in that last year. 
So I might have some money to go out and get that done if uh, if uh, if you can actually uh, go talk to people and get things done. <laughs> but, uh, that's in June, early June. That's it for me. Cool. Anybody else have anything you wanted to share? Nick, what was the what's the advantage of a front wheel drive bike? Um, when I built my first one, it was just the novelty. Um, I was young and uh, enthusiastic at the time, and I, um, uh, I I used to go to these human powered vehicle championships uh, or competitions, rallies every year, and I would try to learn how to ride every different kind of bike. And there were dozens of different kinds of bikes. If you can imagine, you know how hard it was to learn to ride a bike for the first time. Imagine doing that um, like 30 times in a week. So uh, I rode this one front wheel drive that uh, you know some of the home builders were showing there. And uh, uh, so I did it because it was really easy to do. I was living in Seattle at the time and uh, none of my other recumbents would fit on the bus rack, but I figured uh, I could, um, I could easily convert a kid's stingray. Uh, I'll show you. This was easy to do. Um, I know people have done this conversion in like half an hour. Um, um, I bought this kid's spring, string ray at a uh, garage sale in my neighborhood. And uh, then uh, my carpool partner at the time, uh, uh, I told him I needed a, a donor bike frame. He said, oh, my neighbor's got this one that's been sitting in his front yard for 10 years. You can have that. So that's what this is. Um, I'm, a friend helped me braise uh, these nuts onto the fork. We sawed the back out of the 10-speed frame and sawed a, a stem clamp off of a headset to make this adjustable beam here and and i had a um and so we built the bike in a weekend but it took me six months to learn how to ride it <laughs> but i used to commute um and then i had a recumbent seat on here um i used to ride this 25 miles to work every day when i lived in seattle i'm selling that one so get a little room uh other advantages these these other ones um uh you have a really short chain run, I guess, is the one uh, really logistical advantage. And uh, these bikes, um, like this one, are really fast because you're basically stretched out like a missile, you know, feet first. And, um, um, you know, the, uh, the power goes straight to the drive wheel. There's not the really long stretch of chain going to the rear wheel like on a regular recumbent. Yeah. So, and it's, um, and it's weird, you know, it's <laughs> so, uh, and, and, uh, there's only actually one, um, there's one manufacturer that is making front wheel drive, uh, twisting chain front wheel drives like this. And I've actually got one of their folding bikes over, um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it very well. This it's got the 20 inch wheels it's hanging down there. Uh, I bought that last year for a trip that I'm going on hopefully still uh, the the bike bike group I ride with my Quaker meeting um, uh, does a tour every two years and we're planning to go to Glacier Park this summer and um, I bought this bike because it folds up and it'll fit in the car to transport out there everybody else in the group has normal bikes and I try to I try not to be normal but uh, try to fit in cool thanks Nick Thanks, Casey. Chris. Casey, what do you, uh, I'm always nervous whenever you send me any YouTube links to anywhere. I, I just don't, you know, YouTube's got that algorithm and once you play a video that you didn't really want to play, it suddenly everything's just derailed for you forever on. You no, know, I was just uh, sharing one of my favorite YouTube videos that I've been passing time with. I, I, I actually think it's probably some of the best content on YouTube. It's uh, this guy, <laughs> he goes by MP called Main Presenter and it's like super technical stuff. Like I just got some new uh, thermal epoxy that he created in his lab and the stuff is absolutely amazing. But then I, I've also got some other epoxy products I'm working on too. So I kind of show that, but um, I've got just a kind of a, did a test here with uh, just some plywood and I doped this epoxy that I got from Raka 
Um, it's a place down in Florida. It's like a hundred bucks for six quarts of really, really good epoxy. And I've been really happy with it. Um, but I doped it with some just basic carbon um, black because we're putting up some concrete panels on the front of my house and we needed something that was a subset that would be very waterproof, UV resistant. And the commercial kits that we were looking at were just like thousands and thousands of dollars. And this here looks like I can get away for, for about 150 bucks. So um, thought it was kind of cool, figured I'd share it. Um, I threw the link in for Raka. They've got a ton of different products. Again, really happy with it. And then uh, the YouTube video, trust me, you won't be put on any list if you watch it. You'll actually probably enjoy it. It's really, really, if you really like really in-depth stuff, um, this guy goes over the top. It's, it's pretty good stuff. So those are my updates, essentially. So the YouTube video, the link is the, uh, is like a content producer page or was there a video that you linked to that was just the epoxy? Uh, that was just, that, that's just this, that, that is just his page. That is just, oh, I see. His, it's his like, channel, the, I guess. Yeah. it's like the sixth one down. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. Their, yeah. their thermal epoxy versus store-bought. It's gotcha. stuff is good, man. It's well-priced too, you know? Oh, see, I, I think this is where you got to always scroll back to like, what was the person's first video and figure out where they started. But it's, they, they seem competently insane there as well. So, you know, started, started with lasers and went to other things. Well, he's built all his own lasers. It's pretty impressive stuff. Um, the guy's got just a wealth of information. And if you want to, you, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, kill some time during this pandemic, <laughs> you guys can go check it out. But some of us don't aren't looking for time to kill Casey. I mean, I, I'm not sure what you're doing at home there, but I, he's looking quite, for work. I'm, I'm staying quite busy. I'm surprised. I feel like I actually have more to do now. I don't know why. It's maybe because I'm wasting time driving around, hanging out with other people and everything. But <laughs> but um, Jeez, no, it's been good. I, it's fine. It's fun. I, I don't mind it. I, I like staying at home. It's all good. I, I, I mean, I could do this forever, to be honest. It's like whatever. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> How's the how's the college student marketing business going? Is that oh, is that dead going in the water. Hour? Dead in the water, man. Dead? I mean, okay. all the college kids are gone, and the open rates went to crap. And like everyone called me up, and they're like, "Well, you've got Act of God in your contract, so we'd like to pull back everything." And I'm like, "All right, whatever." So it's funny we actually committed the uh, the because we prepaid for all of our Amazon processing for the year. So I'm losing a ton of cash right now, which is really enjoyable. Um, but I'm taking it with a great, and it's fun, whatever. So I took all these CPU cycles and we've actually been playing with a lot of algos in uh, predicting the stock market. And we've actually come up with some fairly interesting stuff. Um, I'm not going to say success just yet, but, uh, I mean, we're going to put some money in and see if we can trade, I guess. We'll see how it goes. I don't Start know. with the penny stocks, buddy. Start with the penny stocks. Oh no, actually, no, you can't. Can't say, <laughs> can't do I know. Penny. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. <laughs> um, mid, mid large cap, there seems to be some pretty interesting trends that, um, we make about 40 trades a year on average, 20 years, uh, non survivorship bias was removed. Um, we did a lot of stuff and I, I, I think we've got something somewhere trading right now. Our annual returns are somewhere between 40 and 45%. Um, you know, I, I, I've we'll seen, see I've seen this on Reddit on wall street bets. So I, I wish you the best of luck. I would say uh, statistically you will lose, but uh, hopefully you're ahead of the curve somehow. Well, we did some things the that are a little stats, different. Casey, stats. <laughs> it's a, it's a you different can't win. Thing. Built, built some things a little differently. Took a different approach at it. Not, uh, yeah. That's There's lies, I, lies, damn lies, and then statistics, buddy. That's all I gotta say. I can't, I can't give you guys any financial advice. I'm not, <laughs> exactly. I'm not a CPA, CFA, or whatever the hell it is. I just want to stay out of jail for this one, you know. But. <laughs> but. Oh. All right, Mr. Mark. But it did work out with Chris. If you've got like thirty thousand dollars of cycles sitting out there on Amazon, you can actually do a lot of computation fairly quickly. I will just put that out there. Ridiculous. I'll stick to buying. I'll stick to buying and reselling epoxy. That sounds like a better bet. It's very straightforward. I would agree with it. <laughs> Mr. Mark, how's the Stevens Point doing? We need the we need the northern Wisconsin perspective on this whole virus thing. You're muted, by the way. <laughs> Video. I have video. No, you can't you read lip? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's been interesting to watch the makerspace up here that, uh, I mean, from afar. I don't know. So they've, they've done a bunch of masks, so it's been, uh, and I'm not sure how they're in and out of that place has been. 
but they, you know, it's, it's that whole seeing that as they're, I don't know how new they are, but I think they'll do something. I don't know what their funding is and they got a boat up boatload of money because they're attached. But other than that, people don't wear masks up here, so they can't really make masks. But my older daughter's done with college as a, or done with the semester. And so um, I don't know how many others have people of that age, but graduating into this uh, market's going to be an interesting thing. So she has actually applied to some of these uh, tracker, uh, the contact oh, tracing. So I'll be, yeah, I'll be interested yeah. to hear how the hacking goes on that. Yeah, the, uh, I, I got done with school in 2008 and decided maybe grad school didn't look too bad for two years to get out in 2010. So that was, <laughs> that's, that's a strategy, Mark. You got another yeah, that's, to probably, pay for. that's probably true, but she's got the, so, but it's interesting where I'm, cause I'm also in the general sense of just, I don't know, people are, I'm hanged into it. Every Peace Corps volunteer in the cunt in the world all got brought home. So they're all hitting the job market at the same time. And they all compete for the same federal jobs because they get something called non-compete. So I'm on a list basically of people just like just trying to grab for something. It's uh, it's kind of a drag, and you know they're 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 telling them they can go back, but they don't. You know, and a lot of them would have been probably just as fine where they were. But uh, it's 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 going to be an interesting time for everybody, I think. All right. Anybody got anything else they want to share? Otherwise, we can call it a night. All right. Well, I, I don't see. Oh, Sarah is still there. Never mind. Never mind. Forget I mentioned it. Forget I mentioned it. If if anyone if anyone needs something done, let me know. Uh, I am definitely not sitting on my hands here, but I can uh, try to help if I can. Thanks for all the hard work you're doing. Definitely appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks, thanks for hosting. Yeah. Thank you, Scott and uh, Sean, for helping to put up some trim the other day and Scott for making his kids dig holes. So it's, uh, it's been, we're getting there. Slow but sure. Outside work anyways. Truly my pleasure. Where is, where <laughs> is Heather? Is Heather around? Is she available? Heather, Heather's around. Make she, sure she's, she's all right. <laughs> she's on her own phone call. So. Oh, she she's, is. Uh, right. Yeah. She, let's see here. I might be able to creep in. I don't know if I got, I don't know if I got good enough zoom. Let's see. No, we just want to make sure she's okay. I haven't seen her in a while. She's over. <laughs> it's a big shop. She's over there hiding. Oh, that's good. <laughs> she's got her. She's got her headset on. So she's. Uh, that's all she does. She sits on the phone. Like, eh, I would say the vast majority of the day. Wow. You know those remote workers. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Have a good evening, everybody. Right, guys. See you later. Good to see everybody. everybody. See you.